you mentioned the atom bomb, Oppenheimer. Is it similar to AI in that once unleashed, it can't be turned off? And I think the answer is yes. It's a very good question, but um, all the evidence is that once these things get out there, in fact, of course, there's a huge difference between AI and uh, nuclear energy, and that is that in order to make a bomb, you need a massive infrastructure of uh, uh, huge industry and all the rest, and therefore it's very hard to conceal that you're doing this um, and therefore, ever since the invention of the atomic bomb, there's actually been a, an international control over the dissemination of nuclear weapons. You cannot do that with AI. AI is, is something that is on open release. Uh, it, it's spreading across the world. We know that uh, not just in the States, we know that China, countries in the Middle East, Russia, North Korea, they're all involved in this race. And so, I think it is. It, it's, it's unleashed. It's not going to go away. The genie is out of the bottle. Yeah. I suppose the question is, does it make any difference then when these tech giants who are a bit worried about AI say, hey, we need to have a moratorium, we need to slow things down? I mean, you can't necessarily tell that to China. Well, you? that's absolutely right. And in fact, you know, I, I mentioned this call from the Future of Life Institute to stop everything and so on. It didn't happen. Sorry, the Future of Humanity Institute. So, um, although it's well-meaning, why don't we pause everything and just, uh, I, I just try and think, it does seem there is this out-of-control race going on. And the other really troubling thing is that there's a, a huge inequality of arms between the tech pioneers and then the regulators. Mm. And a lot of it is to do with how much money, the salaries that the tech industry can pay. They are paying footballer-like salaries to the very best computer scientists. And governments and universities simply cannot compete with the concentration of talent, the very best talent that's going on. So there's a, there's a real problem, mm. I think, as to how you regulate and control the companies both in the West and, uh, and elsewhere in, across the world. I mean, speaking of inequality, one of the questions here is, is about since power corrupts, are we likely to see AI essentially working in favor of the most powerful, the most wealthy, and so on? Well, I think because of cap the way that capitalism works, what, unless it is regulated, there is a natural tendency for it, it to enhance the most powerful, the, the richest people on the planet, and therefore to enhance difference. Now, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, and, and in fact, in, in many areas, including in healthcare, I can imagine that AI is a kind of democratizing force. I mean, it, in theory, it's possible for anybody in the planet who has a smartphone to have access to the very best sophisticated healthcare, which until recently was only available from highly trained and very expensive experts. Uh, so so the, there is potentially huge democratic and equalizing forces here, but there is nonetheless um, this tendency to power, for a concentration of power in a very small number of extremely wealthy people. There's a theological question that's had a lot of upvotes from Hannah, who says, if friction, as you were saying earlier, is necessary for human flourishing, how does that fit with the Christian view of heaven, which in theory has no more friction, i.e. no more sin, suffering, or pain? It's a bit of a sort of left field question, but it's quite an interesting one. What, what do you think of that? It's an intriguing question, isn't it? And um, I, I think that the problem is, uh, perhaps inevitably, all we have is a large amount of speculation about what the future existence, the new heaven and the new earth might be. Um, I think of the verse where it says, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what's never entered into human hearts is what God has prepared for those who love him. So even the wildest science fiction speculation is way off compared with the vision of what the new heaven and the new earth might be. The closest we get to it uh, from Christian thinking is the resurrection appearances of Jesus after death. It's the kind of first contact with the physics 2.0 <laughs> of, of, of the new heaven and the new earth. And the extraordinary thing about the risen Jesus is, is how ordinary his life is. They have this wonderful, if you know the Bible, you'll know that there's this barbecue on the beach 
that the risen Jesus prepares for his disciples. So it's presented in extraordinarily recognizable human terms, and yet it's different. it is different. Yes. Uh, and I mean, what, what's always struck me is that Jesus still has the marks of his death, yeah, yeah. The, the, the nail marks. And there's something about that that suggests to me that whatever that new heaven and new earth is, our, the struggles we've experienced in this life are going to be somehow bound up into that, uh, but redeemed at somewhere, in some way. And I think there's no reason to think that we'll all be just sitting around on clouds playing harps. I think it's going to be a place where the goodness of work is expressed, creativity. You know, it's not going to be a boring place in that sense. So, so for me, I think that, yeah, friction in the right way, in the kind of, you still have to create and think and, you know, be an imaginative person in that world. Absolutely. And another aspect of that is, is that when you take the great drama of the narratives of Scripture, which starts uh, the beginning of the Bible and goes towards the end, it's often been said that the, the story starts in a garden, but it ends in a city. And the city is of the New Jerusalem, which is an extraordinary vision of, of human community, but where the glory and the honor of the nations are brought in. So it's even speculatively possible to say that the very best of technology, the very best of human creativity is brought into the holy city, the New Jerusalem. Another slightly theological question, um, but on a, in a different way. Will AI replace God? Hmm. I'm reminded of, there's a famous science fiction short story where the, um, the scientists create the world's most powerful supercomputer in order to address the question, is there a God? <laughs> and eventually they switch on the supercomputer and they type it in, is there a God? And it whirs away and it says, there is now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think this, this idea that supercomputer, uh, super intelligent beings could take on a kind of quasi-divine status. Mm. You know, that, 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 those ideas are there in science fiction. And from a Christian perspective, um, we would see this as a, as a form of idolatry, isn't it? It's to mm. take a product of human hands and then invest it with some kind of spiritual significance. Uh, that's something that human beings have been doing from time immemorial. So, so in a sense, yes, it could become a god, but it, it'll be like all the other gods, a false god. In that a sense. false god, but a very powerful god, because one mm. of the bizarre things about idolatry, both ancient idolatry and modern idolatry, is that the thing we create from human hands suddenly starts to exert right. some power over us. Yeah. You start to look like the gods you, you worship. Start to look yeah. Like. Um, and another interesting question here, and it's, it's on sort of some of the social media that we use these days. Um, someone's saying that now on Snapchat, which is very popular with a lot of young people, there's a sort of AI response. And what is that going to do to younger generations as they increasingly just naturally start to interact with AI chatbots and things in that kind of way? Well, speaking as a paediatrician, this is something of, of huge concern, I think, for, for everybody who's concerned about child development. Because surprise, surprise, it turns out that human beings, human children are designed to interact with a three-dimensional world. I mean, who would have thought it? <laughs> they actually seem to be designed to explore and reach out. And they're also designed to reach out and touch a human face and start to engage with this other human person. And so, and when you change all that, and instead the human, the child's experiences of a two-dimensional screen, um, that fundamentally changes. There's already neuroscientific evidence of how that changes the nature of brain development. And so, I, I feel very concerned about the potential adverse effects of children being exposed to AIs from early on. There is already now a, a move starting amongst people in this space to say that. 16 years of age is a kind of cutoff at which human beings get to a degree of emotional, intellectual, neuroscientific maturity to be able to engage with social media, to engage with the internet and so on. And that before then, it would be much better for children if they were not, and if they were engaging in the old fashioned way. Now try telling that to your teenagers 
but I think, the, I think the evidence is increasing. I suspect future generations will look back at us and say, how could you have been mad enough to allow young children to be exposed to this stuff? I mean, just keeping with the realms of what could be, someone asks this, um, if people are genuinely having boyfriend-girlfriend relationships with AI these days, could marriage between AI and humans be legalized one day? <laughs> Just asking for a friend, they say. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, think, I think, yeah, anything's possible, and, um, and, and maybe it'll get wildly attractive. Though, and then the question is, what about polyamory? You know, I mean, should you be faithful to your AI? <laughs> Or, or would you be allowed to have more than one? Wow. There's all kinds of cra crazy questions that that, that engenders. Um, if we think humans are fundamentally different to AI, one person asks, that there's a personhood dimension to humans, are there things that AI won't be able to do, can't achieve? Are there things we could say, no, I know that's, that's an AI and not a human? That's a really interesting question, isn't it? I'm not sure I know the answer, apart from at the deepest intuitive level. I think in terms of demonstrating, um, you know, there's a fascinating question which is related to this is, could an AI be conscious? Could an AI actually have consciousness in the way that we know of our own existence and awareness? And the honest answer is, we will never know, because we can never know what it means what it's like to be a computer. And therefore, sooner or later, we're going to have AI systems that claim to be conscious, that claim to have all the experiences, even that may claim to suffer pain. There are people out there who are saying, if that happens, and I suspect it'll happen within a, a matter of years, we're going to have to create committees where these systems are going to be assessed and analyzed to see whether they reach the criteria to be granted legal personhood. If they do, then they're going to have machine rights. They're, we're not going to be allowed to switch them off without their consent. We're not going to be allowed to cause them suffering. We mustn't work them too hard. They're going to have enough time for rest. And they're, and they're probably going to have a vote and, and be part of a democratic so you may all think this is mad. There are people who are already planning for that um, eventuality. And the problem is, how will we ever know? So, Well, well that, this leads on to a, perfectly to a question here. It's been asked a couple of different times, but it's how soon will AI be truly intelligent with its own will, with free will? I mean, like you say, could we even know, I suppose, is the question. I mean, ultimately, I think these things are very, very sophisticated simulations. But as I was trying to given the personal dimension, there's a different aspect of being human. And if you go back to the things I mentioned, um, the fact that we are locked in relationships, whether we like it or not, we have fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters and friends and so on. Um, we are actually aware of a greater reality, of a, of a, a, a morality, good and evil. We understand truth. We have a longing for truth. Uh, and we have this longing and questing for something better. Now, none of those are authentic to the machines. The machines can simulate it, but they are not essential to the nature of what it means to be a human being. So I think this is why we need to think more deeply, don't we, about the uniqueness of humanity, the specialness of humanity. And, and that's why these old themes about human beings made in God's image, human beings being unique and so on, suddenly have a, a new relevance, don't they, to this, they do. this period? They do. Now, there's, there's quite a few questions with a common theme that are quite popular here. One of them says, will AI provoke the end of humankind? But there are others asking it with a more of a theological spin, saying, is AI the Antichrist? Are these sort of something to do with the book of Revelation and so on? So, and there is a kind of apocalyptic kind of dimension to this. You've already mentioned the sci-fi films and things. So it's no wonder that people kind of relate it to these sorts of things. I mean, is that, is that going beyond what we know, that the AI signals some kind of big departure in world affairs, could be the end of humankind, could be signs of the end and so on? Well, if you just take what is often now called existential risks to the human race, 
you know, that, that there are thinkers out there and they have a list of things like an asteroid collision, a nuclear holocaust. You know, what are the things that could completely annihilate the human race? Um, Another would be a, 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 well, a global pandemic, uh, climate change, which would make the planet completely uninhabitable. And we've added now the fifth one, which is AI. Um, and so it is there on the list. It's amazing that about four of those five are all human invented things, <laughs> ways we've invented to possibly wipe ourselves out. Indeed. Yeah. And, uh, and so I think there are people out there who are thinking these kind of apocalyptic thoughts and how we might protect ourselves as human beings from th this ultimate catastrophe. I personally think that this is science fiction mm -hmm. and that we have much more to free a fear from evil human beings who get control of these systems and use them for their own evil human purposes than that the systems themselves are gonna go rogue. Um, how does this relate to, you know, the book of Revelation and to our understanding. I mean, you know, the first thing to say as a kind of health warning is that if you know anything about church history, you know that Christians have been predicting the end times and the Antichrist for 2,000 years. And um, there's always been a kind of industry of, of saying this is the end of the world and these are the signs of the times and so on. So I think one has to be extremely cautious. I mean, having said that, there are... Um, one of the fascinating things that which comes up in, in the book of Revelation is the idea of a deception which is so profound and so clever that it could deceive even the very elect, as I think in the words of the, mm -hmm. of the Bible. And, and so this idea of the threat of counterfeit, the threat of deception, uh, has always been there. There's always been deceivers. There have always been those who've attempted to, who, who have, have been apparently good and have turned out to be deceptive. I think that AI gives new power to the deceivers, new power. And, and in some way, it's the deception of good, the deception of compassion and empathy and, and care and all those kind of things, some of these very precious human realities. It, it's the counterfeit of that which worries me more mm. than the killer robots. Um, there's, there's a lot of questions about um, jobs and security and that kind of thing. Here's one who says, what hope is there for future generations with AI replacing all the jobs? What would motivate a young person to get educated, go to university, work hard or get a job? Well, yeah, a very practical question. What, 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 do you think that's gonna be the, the end result of, of what AI does? Well, I do, th I do think these are very real questions, particularly for young people. And, you know, it, it used to be said not very long ago that if you really want to educate your children and prepare them for the future, the most important thing is to teach them programming, coding, teach them maths and science. It's now turning out that these systems are particularly good at programming and themselves and coding and that perhaps we're going to need far fewer uh, human beings to do this than we thought. So it is incredibly difficult to look into the future. I think that having said that, um, developing a real deep understanding, the, these systems have a kind of superficial, superficial understanding of reality. They don't really have that kind of deep mastery which human beings can develop. And I, I, I suspect that there's always going to be a place for human beings who develop deep understandings of skills and abilities and creativity. Um, and, and the caring professions, it's very hard to believe that, that the ability to care for others, the ability to teach and encourage others, that these kind of skills are gonna go out, out of fashion. So I, I, I think it's important to give hope to our next, to the next generation. One of the biggest risks is a, is a wave of fatalism and despair, mm -hmm. isn't it, among young people, which is, which is deeply concerning. And uh, equipping children, to giving them this resilience, this perseverance, the, the character traits, I think, are always going to be valuable. And, and that comes from human-to-human -human interaction. Maybe 
children need their parents even ever more. One of the sad things I see so often is a, a child, a young child, maybe being held or in a buggy, who's desperately trying to get the attention of their mother or their father, and the mother or the father is staring at a screen. And uh, what message are we giving to our children if we're not there for them and understand how face-to-face -face interaction is the most important? Someone's sent in a question saying, I'm a founder who is building an AI-driven health startup and using AI to help build this. Um, how do I start to apply the values, ethics, and guardrails that you're talking about into my startup? So that's a really, again, practical question. What, for someone who's literally using this technology, what does the Christian faith, I suppose, have to say to, to how we go about doing that? Well, I think those are exactly the right questions, and it needs to be a, a discussion, doesn't it? How, how do we, we need to be part of these discussions. How do we make, how do we code AI systems which are actually good for humanity, which encourage our personhood, which encourage relationships, which encourage face-to-face -face interactions? Uh, is it possible to code systems not just to maximize profit, not just to maximize engagement and, and eyeballs, but actually to encourage human flourishing. I, th I think I don't have any simple stick answers, but I think the questions are absolutely right. Interestingly, there are lots of people, Christians and other people of faith and goodwill, who are all working in the tech industry. And they want to go to work and believe that what they're doing, what they're spending all their time doing in front of a computer screen, is actually they're doing it for good. They don't want to just be fostering the profits of some other billionaire somewhere in Silicon Valley. So, so there is a real hunger amongst tech workers to know how to use their skills in AI for good. And I think you know, churches and Christian communities ought to be encouraging uh, workers in the tech industry and saying, we're supporting you. We want to be part of this conversation. Yeah. Uh, and I get a sense, again, it's from some of the questions coming in, that there's some people who are a bit worried that the church and Christians can sometimes be a bit, oh, it's all terrible and you know, we need to avoid this. When someone's asking here, isn't the greater risk by far that we will underuse new technology and miss out on some kind of greater flourishing? Well, I think there is a risk there. I, I, I think you know, the reaction of the Amish in, um, in the States has always been to try and withdraw and retain a previous uh, form of technology. I, th I think it's not true that they're completely opposed to technology, but they're very, very critical of, and about how technology might affect their community. I, I think our, the future is not in withdrawal, not in, in kind of protection, but it is in a really thoughtful understanding uh, engagement. I think one of the most important things, to be honest, is that we all need to develop AI literacy. The, the, this is, and in a way, this event might be seen as a, an initial attempt to try to encourage people in AI literacy. Th these, these developments are so basic, so important, that really we all need to know and, and, and get ourselves up to speed so that we can be part of the conversation. I mean, you've sort of hinted at it there, but there's, there's another great question here, which says, as the church, rather than sit by and watch this happen, how can we be part of influencing and shaping AI and other web technologies? Absolutely. I, I think there is a, a problem here, and that is so many people in positions of authority of the church, church leaders and, and so on, are people who basically study the humanities um, at school and, and university. They, they gave up science at the age of 16. They're not interested in any of this. They're not interested in science fiction. So it's hardly surprising that many church leaders are going to struggle when it comes to engaging with this stuff. And that makes me feel that actually it's the people in the tech industry who are also believers who are there in the church. And these people become a very, very significant resource because we really can't expect the church leaders to be able to, to guide us. We need people together working in the industry who will be part of the solution and not just part of the problem. Maybe a final question. When and how should we start using AI in church? Um, I mean, do, is there a place for AI in, in church? An AI priest, I've heard of the thing, but I mean, <laughs> again, it kind of sells, sends chills down my spine, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I think what's much closer to home is, you know, how much are people using chat GPT and things like this just in normal church activities? To write their sermons. To write their sermons, yeah. Bible study outlines, discussion groups. And the answer is a huge amount. It's, it's, you know, the reality is people are, often unthinkingly, uh, and I found, find that really scary. Um, and I think this is why AI literacy, helping to educate people uh, in the nature of these systems and what they're trained on, and then how to use them for good, uh, it, it is really important. So I personally think that we should be very cautious about using these very sophisticated large language models and so on because we don't know what the origin of the, of the text is. And at the moment, I'm pretty keen to say that uh, everything that I produce is, is authentically steam-powered <laughs> human <laughs> creation. For the time being. In, including this excellent <laughs> booklet, which, which you wrote for this evening's event. And do, do take that home with you. Have a read. Pass it on to someone, maybe. There's some really great further resources that are mentioned here, including, um, I think there's a link to the word one-to-one -one as well, um, which is a great resource if you're interested in pursuing the conversation on, as you were saying, the God who became flesh. It's, it's all about the first chapter of John's gospel. Um, so there's lots of, lots of ways to take this forward in in the old-fashioned way, with a good old booklet. Um, but, but thank you so much, John, for spending some time talking to us, guiding us through these, these really quite tricky conversations. And it's something I'm sure we're going to return to in due course, because this is the age we're living through, and God calls us to be faithful and, do, and follow him through it. But can we have another round of applause? Thanks so much, John. Thank you very much.